we'll start. So welcome everybody to this uh, talk today, which is um, about macro photography. So um, I'm assuming most of you have already uh, participated in the earlier talks, um, which were various uh, topics that included macro photography as well as wide angle. And today I want to focus on macro photography. So um, just before we go into that, a couple words about myself. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm German, but I've been living in Hong Kong for 12 years. Um, everything in scuba diving is good for me. So uh, tech diving, free diving, all of it's good. I'm a photographer and, uh, and also a author for, um, for magazines primarily, uh, but I also talk at dive shows. Um, and uh, I'm a photo coach. Uh, so over the years, I've developed sort of kind of a wider curriculum that I like teaching, um, bringing people closer into photography, giving people uh, help to get their photography onto the next level. I'm also an ambassador for Isotta, Hollis, Bear, Atomic, and a couple of others, and they really help me uh, uh, do the work that I do um, by supporting me with their equipment. Um, Insider Divers is my travel company. Uh, we organize uh, dive trips for groups, so all of our trips are for groups, um, and there's always somebody like myself, an expert, leading those trips, um, uh, making sure that the itinerary is unique and special and making sure that you have a really good time. And we always focus on education and coaching. So on all of our trips, we uh, try to learn something about the animals that we see or the, the reefs that we encounter or whatever, uh, or we do photography specific things. So while we were all stuck here due to this stupid virus, I thought um, let's start doing this webinar series um, and we've now already done like 25 or something webinars. Um, you can find them all on my YouTube channel um, which you can find at youtube.com inside of divers. Um, so there's lots of other photography talks if you're interested in that, but we also have several talks about sharks or manta rays. We had lots of guests and we have more exciting guests coming. So at the end of this talk, I'll tell you who's coming uh, this week and next week. Really cool photographers are coming to talk as well. Um, so yeah, if you're not um, subscribe to our channel yet, do that and have a look at all the other talks that we've done already. Uh, just a couple words about uh, Zoom. If you haven't used it before, you are all muted and your video is off. And that's just because, um, you know, primarily I'll be talking and before we get somebody to actually go live until the video is working and the audio is working, it just takes way too much time. So please use the chat. Um, if you have uh, comments like saying hello, just like, uh, um, oh, thank you, Teresa. That's very nice to I uh, say that, that you said I kept you sane with these talks, so that's I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so uh, comments like these, um, just put them in the chat. If you have questions, please put them in the Q and A. So if you can't find the Q and A that's in your bar, so uh, just have a look. There is a Q and A, um, and um, and there uh, you can put your questions. Um, I have one big screen where I'm trying to organize it all, so I'm trying to. Uh, see uh, all the questions while they happen. If I don't answer them immediately, please just save them up until the end. But I will try to keep an eye on the questions um, to answer them live. Okay, so um, today uh, we're going to talk about how to take uh, pictures or shoot the coolest critters that we have, like this blue ring octopus. Um, we uh, want to talk about how to separate your subject from the background, even if it's a really tiny one like this um, uh, Denise. Uh, Denise Pygmy Seahorse in, that I had in Triton Bay, which is called the Santa uh, Seahorse. Um, I want to introduce you to some uh, variation on uh, lighting techniques. Um, you can already see this is not the typical front lighting, so I want to go through that. And I want to talk about how to uh, do clean back, black backgrounds because it's a very nice stylish element that's very important in the photography. Uh, we're also going to talk about snoot, actually. Um, my colleague and friend Pauline uh, is going to join us later to explain uh, snoot photography a little bit more. Um, so she's uh, going to join us later for that. Um, I'm also going to uh, talk about what I call x-ray uh, photography, which we use snoots or uh, strobes for. So it's one creative technique that we do. And also how to combine different techniques, including torch lighting. Now, I was going to do more, but it is just too much. So I've now decided to actually make another macro talk. Uh, before we do the wide angle. So the time that was planned for the wide angle, which was in two weeks, is now going to be macro two. And then we're going to do a separate wide angle session uh, another two weeks later. So every two weeks I do a photo talk. Uh, I take quite a lot to prepare these. So bear with me that it takes, you know, two weeks or so to, um, um, to, to prepare them. But the next one is going to be macro. And then after that, we're going to have a wide angle. Actually, we're also going to have a Photoshop one in between. So uh, if you, uh, are interested in that, you can join that as well. So next time then I will talk about how you use your uh, camera 
to create more creative photography like uh, slow shutter or long exposure like you can see here. Uh, we're going to talk about wide apertures and super wide apertures. We're going to talk about super macro and about disco bokeh, so where you can use uh, uh, certain backdrops to create interesting photography. Um, so these are some of the techniques that we're going to be covering in that next section in two weeks. So let's get into macro photography. First, I want to talk about the approach. Um, first of all, before we go anywhere, I want to point out that it's really important that you do not disturb the animals. They are simple beings, so they're not like a dog or a dolphin or something like that, but uh, even shrimp and uh, nudibranchs deserve to be treated with respect. So um, obviously there are certain shots where um, it is useful if you can entice the animal to sort of uh, be more visible, let's say, or, uh, uh, um, you know, come out of hiding a little bit, that is something that you should not be doing yourself. This is something that only experienced guides should do, and they should also only do it in very limited manner, right? So um, if we're interfering too much with the animals, that is not fair. Um, They're not there for our pleasure. They have their life. Uh, all we want to do is take photos. So do I believe that you could uh, sort of entice a shrimp to move slightly along uh, uh, a crinoid uh, or something yes you can but should you be like digging him out of his uh, hiding no you shouldn't should you make them come out no should you place them on other environments no so all of this absolute no no definitely do not use your finger for anything because a you can get hurt but also you can actually uh, really make uh, um, problems for the animal by either hurting them or disturbing the uh, bacterial pattern that they have their own body etc so do not use your finger or your pointer please only let guides and experienced people do deal with that just uh, you know photo photo should be secondary first should be the photo first should be the animal. Um, so a couple things about macro photography. Um, uh, we have the subjects here. In general, we have a lot more time with these subjects. It's not like a shark that swims away. So we have a lot more time to actually get behavioral photography done, which in wide angle is a lot harder because you have to be in the right moment, whereas here we have more time for it. Also, because they don't move as much, we've got much more room for creativity. We can just do a much more creative approach to the whole thing and we can try more things we can get closer we can go further away we can use multiple diopters we can try all kinds of things because we have time with the animal so this is my biggest tip with macro photography is take your time when you start with photography lots of people will just take you know a couple of photos and then move on no with a you know uh a nudibranch or a shrimp you you know knock yourself out keep shooting you know and uh, take your photos and this is a real chance for you to get better so just take many many photos and then try doing the same thing again after you've looked at them on your computer so here is an example of you know classic uh, thing that you get in uh, in uh, lembe is all the clownfish almost all of them have these parasites but it's very difficult to actually see the parasite you always see the eyes or something but in order to actually uh, get the shot with the uh, tongue-eating parasite properly, you have to wait and you have to take lots and lots of photos because whenever the uh, uh, clownfish is like moving his mouth open, you have to shoot right in that moment and still you will miss it. So what you actually want is when the clownfish yawns and that will only happen with time. So you just need to give it time for this photo. I counted roughly nine minutes that I spent I was just looking at my uh, camera feed and I could just see I've been, I was taking photos for nine minutes, 36 photos until I got this shot that I wanted. So you just need to take your time. Also, you want to take your time just to see what the animal does. Once they're, you know, like a shrimp, you put lights on them, your focus light or whatever, and the shrimp might at first be a little bit, you know, taken aback, but with time, they will get used to you and then they will start doing. So shrimp, for example, will start feeding again or crabs will start feeding again and then that's actually what you want to photograph. Whereas if you just try to take your photo and move on, you're actually not going to get a behavioral shot, which is quite important. Um, as you know, I take, uh, uh, I find it very important that we uh, try to get a story in our photos, and I'll say something about that in a moment. But if you take your time and wait, you will see that there is behavioral things that you can bring into your story and you want to try and capture that. Um, and also just, you know, enjoy the situation and don't just do photos. So here's an example, you know, everybody who, who does nudibranchs a lot, that's not me, I don't, it's not my favorite subject in the world, but uh, I do like to shoot them occasionally. But everybody who does them really well will tell you, you just have to wait for a long time and they will always 
either rise up or at least they will uh, move their head up so that you can see the whole face, you know. And in this case, I was just following this Flabellina. I was trying all kinds of photos already. And then he, it rose up and that was the shot. Then obviously that was better than all of the other ones. So just give it some time um, uh, and make sure that you don't uh, rush it because the behavior and special shots will come with that time, you know. Then uh, same like in wide angle, you can do test shots which is quite useful if you're trying to get really close into something, wiggle yourself in somewhere just to get closer to this macro subject. If you then start taking your photos and from scratch do all your settings, you're going to actually waste, uh, um, yeah, it's going to be difficult to do that in that spot, but also you're going to kick up sand, etc. So why not just take uh, some test shots. Um, in wide angle, I said, take pictures of your hand. Now in macro, you take pictures of your finger. Um, and even then you can tell all kinds of things. You can see if your background is black or not. You can see how bright it is. You can see where the light is coming from with your strobe setup. So there's lots of things that you can test mid water before you go in close and take your photograph, right? Um, also, I'd recommend to just try all kinds of different things on the same subject. So here you can see uh, a session that I had with a blueing octopus. If you ever met blueing octopus, they're mostly pretty relaxed. They don't really care about you. You can see this octopus just keeps on walking. Um, and so I try all kinds of things, shot from the front, shot from the side, different angles, snoot here, snoot there, no snoot at all, all of that. And then in the end, you got one that you're gonna keep and that's the one that you like. So just try different things. You're gonna get a lot more out of your photography. Another recommendation that I will give you for your approach is make a shot list. So you know how you have these things, you like really like a photograph of this or really like a photograph of that? Write them down somewhere. Put them in an Evernote or, or, or write them down somewhere. Make a list of the things that you want to take and start thinking about these photos because one day you're going to get exposed and you're going to get this opportunity to take that photograph and then you start thinking okay what am I actually going to do with it so for me I have like a long list of uh, kind of photos that I'd like to take um, or that I've tried taking and didn't like the way it looked so uh, for example the snake eel with the shrimp on top uh, is actually quite simple to get but I have it in a way that I would like to do it with a snoot uh, where you just see the uh, the shrimp fully lit up at the top and the rest of the snake eel is a silhouette it's very difficult to get. I've got it once almost, but it was not good enough. So that's top of my list. So if I see a snake eel, uh, I will see if there is, you know, a, 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 um, a shrimp around. And so I already know what I'm going to try and do, right? And so generally, if you make a list of these things, uh, mentally or in a, in a written down list, you're just going to be ready for when the opportunity presents itself. So I suggest just make a list. Another thing is the mindset. Um, so if you've come to any of my workshops, that's where I really uh, like to coach you to shoot to win. So rather than just having a photo of a flamboyant cuttlefish, I would like you to say, I've got a killer shot of a flamboyant cuttlefish. So think about how are you going to create a photo that has a chance to win? Now, obviously, it's really hard to win awards, but if you think from the beginning always that you're going to try to take a as good picture as possible, then you're going to get much better photos in total. Whereas if you just saw your first flamboyant and you took one photo of it and you're like, wow, I got one, you're not going to get a, a killer shot out of it. So try to keep that in mind that you always try to go for the best possible photograph. So uh, if you've joined uh, my previous sessions, you know that I like to structure it in these three sort of uh, categories, beauty, story, and surprise. I know I've done this already in a general sense. So today I just want to quickly run through a couple of things that are macro specific um, and there are you know, a whole bunch of nice photos. So bear with me while we do that first. So obviously uh, composition is very important. Um, um, uh, Sorry, this is story. Sorry, that was a wrong slide. Um, so uh, what is a story? So it can be all kinds of things. So habitat, so now we're in macro, right? So we've got here the porcelain crab in the environment, so on the anemone crab, and you can see uh, on the anemone coral, and you can see the anemone in the background. So this shows the habitat. Um, here you, you've got the uh, razor shrimp on you know, these um, uh, corals that they like to live on and it shows how it lives. Why is it shaped that way? Well, because of this habitat it lives in. Right? Um, then there's behavior. Um, this is one of my favorite macro behavior shots. This is two coconut octopus fighting over a coconut shell. Um, this is a behavior. This is really interesting because you can see what animals do when we're not around. 
um, and I was very fortunate to witness that. Here's another coconut octopus doing kind of a combination of habitat and behavior. So he's picking up his shells and moving away from me, um, and therefore showing the type of behavior, how they have a moving home that they live in. This is another behavior of uh, a paper nautilus uh, uh, on an, a jellyfish. This is how they travel through the uh, open ocean. And so it is a way of behavior and habitat the same way. Then we have feeding. Here we've got a, a cuttlefish hunting a fish at night. Um, this is actually also a feeding uh, shot. So if uh, you've seen these photos before of the emperor shrimp on the nudibranch, um, Anyway, for me, it took a long time of actually watching these to figure out why they live on the nudibranch. The reason they live on the nudibranch is because they can feed on the side. So the nudibranch is moving really slow over the sand, and when the shrimp is relaxed, so when you are not interfering with it, you will see that they are actually uh, digging through the sand or the, the substrate where the nudibranch is moving through and cleaning up uh, uh, and feeding in the process. So this is actually more of a feeding shot than in the habitat. Here you've got a, a flamboyant cuttlefish hunting. Uh, if you ever tried doing this, it's very, very difficult because they just come out very slow and you want to get it in the moment where it actually uh, grabs the animal, which is very, very difficult because they hunt very, very small things. So this is another one of my uh, wish list shots is actually getting a flamboyant cuttlefish with something big in the mouth, uh, but I've not been lucky uh, to see that yet. Another thing that I personally like doing is pointing out the size. So um, here's a frogfish on a leaf, uh, a hairy frogfish on a leaf. That just shows that they're not that big. And we always think that they're so huge, but they're not really big. And this is something that shows that. Here's a, a mimic octopus on a glove. Uh, also, I felt when I always saw the videos about mimic octopus before I saw my first mimic myself, I was always thinking that they were much bigger than they actually are. And so here there was a glove lying in the sand and that just gave a good impression on how small they actually are. Um, then uh, obviously mating, yeah, uh, so this is nudibranch, two nudibranchs going at it. Um, here's a uh, mandarin fish doing it. This is, by the way, shot with a snoot in Palau. Um, so um, it tried to get this romantic thing where they put the heads together, which is very specific to mandarin fish, is a bit of a story in itself. Then obviously after the mating, you've got the offspring. So this is a very specific thing. This is the sap sucking slug that you, uh, you can get in the Philippines and Indonesia. They're really, really tiny, and they lay these really funky curled eggs. Um, so yeah, here's an offspring photo. Uh, here's a flamboyant cuttlefish in, in an egg. Um, so another type of story that you can make. Uh, here you have a clownfish. Um, this is shot with the snoot, which we'll explain later, uh, while cleaning the eggs. If you've seen this on TV, this is very cool to watch. So they looks like they're eating the eggs, but they're actually just nibbling off the algae. Uh, and oxygenating them with their uh, fins. So uh, here you can see uh, uh, another story, which is basically the parent taking care of uh, the babies. Um, we also got parasites. If you look out, you will actually see quite a lot of parasites in the uh, animal world. They're pretty nasty things. So here you've got a parasite that will live on this uh, goby forever uh, and actually has its own lungs there in the back. And then we've got the tongue-eating parasite that we uh, can get you know, all over Indonesia, someplace in the Philippines. Um, also uh, a very interesting animal because it doesn't kill the clownfish. Um, it's not exactly mutualism, but it doesn't seem to ha hamper the uh, life expectation of the clownfish. Now, normally in wide angle is where we would enter humans, and I have a huge section always about talking about how you can bring humans into pictures. You can also do this in macro, although that is rather rare. Um, this was a, a shot of a baby flamboyant cuttlefish that coincidentally was swimming up just before we're doing our safety stop. So this is me and my dive master Rockless in Lembe, so at Nat, uh, where we always go in, in Lembe. And uh, we were literally about to go up and suddenly this thing just came right in front of us. So now we've made a tradition out of it. And every time I go to Lembe, we take a photo of Rockless's uh, beautiful eyes in front of one of these macro animals. So you can bring humans into macro photography, but it has to be raised. So this is a hairy frogfish sitting on a, one of these ropes um, uh, from one of the uh, boys. And that's the only way how we could get his face into it. And so every time it's a challenge on how to get him uh, behind uh, um, one of these macro subjects. So that's uh, about storytelling, trying to say something with your photos, try to convey a story about the subject, right? Because it's a macro subject, don't try to only make it beautiful, try to make it somehow interesting and try to avoid just having seen it, try to make it interesting.
Yeah. So the next one is um, uh, beauty, which is pleasing to the eye. And that one is uh, the one that I should have called composition earlier because composition is very, very important. Beauty is subjective. So everybody has their own opinion of what's pretty. But if you make everything framed and positioned correctly, you're going to make it much easier for people to enjoy. So here is a good example of the rule of thirds that I already explained before, but in macro, it's just as relevant. So if the animal is slightly off center, it makes it a lot easier to look at the picture. So try and frame the picture like this. Good news is you can always crop that to make it fit. You can see here my original picture is centered, and then I can crop it a little bit to make it a bit more interesting. So we try to keep that space also in the top corner to create negative space. So you can do it either really blurry, so you know, creating bokeh uh, uh, with your uh, wider apertures, but also you can make that a little bit sharper so that you can recognize a bit more. So here with the eels, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that all these cleaner uh, shrimp were visible in the back. And so my, I used a smaller aperture that allowed for a bit more background sharpness. But they are still in the negative space and they create that depth of field because they're still slightly fuzzy. So make sure you leave that space for, the, uh, for your background to convey your story. Then there is the concept of diagonals. We talked about it before with manta rays. Well, you can use diagonals in all photography. So here you can see, well, I see anyway, some diagonals in here um, uh, that make the picture more dynamic. Well, this is very obvious. You've got here very clear diagonals um, that uh, indicate, um, that make a picture more interesting than it would be if it were horizontal. Then there's a couple of more composition rules that are important. Try to make the animal look into the picture, right? If you just get them from the side, just doesn't look that exciting. Um, make sure that the animal somehow looks at the camera, even though the octopus here is not really looking at the camera, it looks like he is looking at the camera. And that is good. You want the animal to face the camera, gives the viewer the impression that there's an actual interaction with you and the animal. What you totally want to avoid is uh, sorry, here's another picture of a nudibranch that's obviously not looking at you, but it is moving into your direction, right? In a sort of semi side view that gives good perspective. And still it looks like the animal is coming in your general direction, but you still see the whole body form. So although these are not eyes, it is useful if you try to make sure that these eyes or rhinophores are looking into your camera. Very important to avoid cutting off essentials. So if you've got an animal uh, like this harlequin shrimp, then you don't want to be cutting off anything substantially there, right? You can see that there my body and also uh, the tips of his, whatever those are, uh, is cut off. So that's not a good thing. Another thing, you already know this from me, is I'm a totally uh, a militant when it comes to ass shots. So a picture of where the tail is in is not a picture. You need to be facing the camera and the face needs to have the highlighting, not the ass, okay? So even this picture here, I was very excited when I, when I shot this for the first time, but it's an ass shot, it's from behind. That's not interesting. You want to see the eyes of the animal. And so from my perspective, ass shots no can do. Another thing that's absolutely not okay is out of focus. If you see this photo, you might think, well, that's actually fine. But if you look at the eyes, the eyes are not sharp. And in a picture like this, the eyes have to be sharp. You can't make a picture like this and have the eyes not sharp. You can, of course, go for like a claw detail, but I messed that up in this picture as well. So make sure that the eyes are always sharp. Otherwise, it's not a good photo. Here you've got another example of something that's in focus and other things that are not in focus. Just looks weird. Here, the antlers, the right of force should be in focus because it's a picture of two new pranks doing it, not actually of the, the, the pranks that we you know, normally are interesting, but in this case, really the rider force of both animals should be sharp. So totally not the way to photograph a picture like that. So make sure you've got your focus right and you've got time. They're nudibranchs, so they're not moving fast. So make sure your focus is uh, properly set. Another thing that's very useful, I find, is full backgrounds. So trying to fill up the whole picture with a certain background. Here I'm going for camouflage. So the shrimp is obviously camouflaged except for the blue eyes or you make the subject separation, but still a full background. So we've still got the full background and then we've got one subject popping out. So then you've got a, a, a clean subject separation with still a full background.
So that was a couple of pointers to beauty. You can already see I'm going a bit quicker through this because we've talked about this in the other sessions. Now I'm coming to technically interesting or the surprising element. And in the surprising element, this is where we've got all kinds of elements that fit into here, right? Um, so one thing that uh, I'm going to be talking about primarily now is light because light is such a big topic. And the other animals like the technical use of your camera, so slow shutter and wide aperture, props and all these kind of things, I'm going to do in the next session because I didn't want to rush it too much uh, today. So we're going to just talk about how to use light effectively to make a technically interesting photograph. If there are any photos at this stage, please uh, let me know in the Q&A. Um, I've got them open, so if you've got any questions before I move into lighting, just let me know. Okay. So, the different lights are obviously, again, the ambient light. Even in macro or close focus like we have here, you've got the camera that's responsible for the ambient light and the strobe that is responsible for subject lighting. So even in a picture like this, you can see the background lighting is actually not lit by the strobe. It is actually natural light that's lighting up the rest of the picture, and I'm only using a snoot to light up the animal. So what you're trying to do is still, even though it's not as important as it is in wide angle, is still have a thought about your ambient background lighting, which you set up with your camera and then you light up your subject with the flash. Now, obviously in macro, it is tempting to light up the whole thing because you can, but as I'll try to show you is there are actually lots of opportunities of making better photos if you use ambient light and strobe light separately. So here's one example of uh, a whip coral goby, um, and you can see the background is blue. So I've set the camera that I can see a blue background, which you know is the blue of the water, and the animal is lit up in it. That's one way of lighting up this animal. But this is another way of the same animal, same whip coral, same time of the day, it was the same dive, of a completely different way of lighting up the animal. You can see the background is much darker now, um, and the animal is also lit up in a different way. So you need to decide on how you want to do your ambient light, and one obvious choice is black backgrounds. Black backgrounds are very beautiful because they allow us to, to, to highlight the beauty of the animal really, really specifically. Um, and actually it's very easy. Essentially, black background photography just means you've got no ambient light. So uh, both of these photos were taken at, at uh, daytime. Uh, I remember specifically that uh, damselfish was taken in the middle of the day in a shallow dive, so the sun is totally bright. But what you can do is you can make the camera set a negative ambient light. You can make it all black. So the camera is set to make everything look black and the strobe is the only light that penetrates that. So if you were to set up a picture like this, you would actually take a test shots with your camera without the strobe on, you turn the strobe off, and you keep taking your test shot until what you see on your screen is actually black. Now you know you've killed all the ambient light and now you can add strobe light to paint in your picture. So that is a way very easy to create black background photography, even in the middle of the day. All you need to do is tune down your camera until it's super, super dark. So lower your ISO, reduce the aperture, uh, and make a fast shutter speed, make sure the picture on the screen looks black, and then you add light into it. So for example, photos like these, Photos like these, where you see the damselfish on the right side, these are two different photos, by the way, but photos like these are actually super interesting and you can take them on any reef at any time of any day when you're doing your safety stop. You can just do a lot more photos when you're just waiting at your safety stop, you crank up the power of your strobes, uh, you just follow a fish around and you just keep shooting, taking photos of them in really, really dark background and you get really nice, interesting photos like this. Roman is asking if you overexpose, does it make your black background easier at post-processing? Post you can expose a little bit higher, but the risk is that you're going to have leftovers in your background and then you have to cut it out. But if you want to take a photo relatively good, you want the background already to be black when you put it into Lightroom, so you only need to fine tune. I'll show you a photo later where I actually deleted the, black, the background to make it black, but it's a lot of work 
You cannot submit it for any competitions. So it is better if you go for this kind of a photo that you shoot it in a way that the background is already pretty dark. Thank you for that question, uh, Roland. So uh, let's talk about those strobes. Yeah. So uh, obviously in wide angle and macro, we have a different setup. Um, in macro, we are shooting much closer, but we're still using the fringe light. So we're still using the outside of our light, unless we're doing a few of the techniques that are coming up, because this reduces our backscatter the most. So generally, we still want to point our, um, uh, our strobes past the subject, so that we are lighting the subject only with the fringe light, so with the outside light. And same like in wide angle photography, the closer the animal is, the closer you need to bring in your strobes. So if you're shooting an animal that's maybe a foot away or 30 centimeters away, something like this, then your strobes should be coming back so that you have a chance to light this up. But once you get it closer, for example, if you're using a diopter, you might be using a focus distance of maybe only four to six centimeters. You need to bring those strobes in closer so that you can still light up the subject with the outside of your uh, strobes. So remember that, that when you go closer to an animal, you need to um, move your strobes accordingly. Now we already come to some fine tuning that is quite important. Um, I don't know if you noticed this, it's the same photo, but on the right and on the left, we've got different power, right? We've got the strobe light is a little bit different. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I'd like to uh, always recommend is that you do what I am calling a light power check. So that is essentially when you uh, close your eyes and you look at the picture, or if you just cover the picture with your hand and pull your hand down, what is the first thing that you see? Because if you take a photo of this frogfish, you already know where the frogfish is. It's quite easy to be happy with this picture because, okay, I've got the frogfish in the picture. But actually, the, the lighting is not very good. I'm going to do this again. So I'm just going to undo this and just have a look what you see first. The first thing that I see is the top of the back, right? The hump, this area here, right? And not the face. But we always want to see the face first because otherwise it's not a, a well-balanced picture. So in the next picture, you can see here, now the light is much stronger on the face and therefore it is a much more natural picture. I'm just going to go back so you can see the difference here and here. And obviously you can see that the back side of the animal is lit in exactly the same way. See, if I go forwards and backwards, you can see the tail is exactly the same. But the left side is stronger. So what does that mean? That means, depending on what you want to achieve with your photography, you need to change the both strobes in different uh, powers because they have different distances to your, uh, to your subject, but also because there are different things that you might want to highlight. So that's something that you want to play with. Another thing that you want to play with is shadowing. To create a shadow, you actually need to shoot the light past something so that there can be a shadow behind. So putting the strobe at higher angles actually allows you to create strobes more than if you keep them all just below. So here's an example where I'm shooting from the top left and there's creating a nice clean shadow across this moray eel and obviously you can see my second strobe is turned off. Here as well, this was actually just shot with one strobe. This was before I had a second strobe. It's an old photo with a compact camera. But you can see by having only one light from the top, we're creating shadows around the animal, which makes actually lots of things interesting. And here's the crooks, guys. So when you upgrade your cameras and you're going to be like, well, I obviously need a second strobe, you will find that lots of your photos are going to start looking flat. Like this rhinopia, you can see that everything is kind of flat. That's because both strobes are equally powered. And that is not helping us always. Sometimes we want a more extreme uh, power on one strobe than on the other. Now you can see we've got real shadow on the left, but also the whole structure of this animal comes out stronger. That is because my right power, my right strobe is now dominant, and my left strobe is less. That is how you can create shadows even though you're using two strobes. One, one strobe needs to be stronger than the other. Another thing that you want to keep in mind is the surface that you're lighting. So here you've got a single strobe photo. This was actually also with my compact camera back in the day. Um, 
and one strobe. So this was, I would call that a lucky shot. But the strobe you can see is coming from the right side here, right? And that is good because the animal is shaped in a way that the light is reaching uh, from that side. And that's what I call surface lighting. That is essentially thinking about what is the surface that we want to light. So if you have an animal like that, this is the surface that you want to light. So here you, you can see, for example, clearly I didn't do a good job on this photograph. The light is coming really hot from the right and it's really weak from the left. But the body of the animal is actually on the left is where the light should be. You know? And uh, so this is not the right way to shoot because we want the animal to nicely be nicely lit up. Here I tried it from the top. I would say it's better. And you can now see the hand or the fin, like how it's on the, you know, on the, uh, um, on the coral. Um, but still, there are some shadows not quite in the right place. So today, if I could shoot this again, I would use this strobe much lower so that the whole side of the animal is lit up. So what you need to do is you need to think about that main surface that you want to light, the main surface that's important to highlight about this animal and direct your lighting towards this surface. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're shining it directly at it, but it means that you're pointing the strobe in that general area. You might still be using your fringe light, but you are not lighting it from below. In this case, you might be lighting it from higher above. Roman is asking, what about strobe positioning parallel to the camera with partial overlapping with strobe port diopter? Okay, so, uh, when you're using a diopter, and I'll be talking about diopters actually in the next session, um, so in two weeks, but generally you need to be careful that you don't create shadows with the diopter, of course, right? But if you're doing things parallel, that's fine, right? For nudie brains, etc. But there are certain animals where it just doesn't work. And so there is where you need to start moving your strobes up and down. So if you watch people that are really into their macro photography, you won't see them just with their strobes here from the side. You will see them always in different angles because you're guiding the light into the areas where you want the light to be. So this is a good example. For example, a crocodile fish yeah, is a flat animal. If you shoot it from the front, you're not going to get a good result. So here, you really want the lighting to come from the top. That doesn't necessarily mean that the strobe needs to be right on top, but it should be lighting from the top. Here's another example, a stargazer. If you shoot that from the front, you're just going to light up a lot of sand. Whereas if you get one strobe from the top, um, then you can get this surface area of the uh, stargazer properly lit out. Another example is nudibranchs, right? Shooting nudibranchs from the front, Roman, as you just asked, right? This would light this animal up not in the right way, in my opinion. About this nudibranch, what's interesting is the surface structure, so having the light from the top is going to be better than having it from the front. So your surface lighting is a thing that's obviously very easy with a single strobe, but you can still use your second strobe as a fill flash. So a fill flash means you're still lighting up a little bit of it, but not as much. Uh, I call that dual power. People have different names for it, but I call it dual power as in two different powers. Yeah? And here's a good example. That's actually Pauline in the picture. You can see the frogfish here is obviously in the right position. The model is in the right position. I got all the corals nicely lit up, but the tail of the frogfish is lit up way too strong compared to the face. So in the next photo, Pauline's already swimming her second round, I guess. Um, I've now increase the power on the left strobe so that the face is stronger lit up. You can see this, the right side of the animal, so the tail side, is still the exact same lighting as before. So if you look at this picture, okay, I changed a little bit my angle as well, but if you look at the tail, it's still lit up in exactly the same way. It's just the face that has changed. So that is what I mean with dual power, is really play with these the, the options that you have in terms of power so that you can fine-tune and get your focus on the right part of the animal. So this, for example, was shot with total low po uh, top power. So this is re really the strobe shooting down on the animal in very low power. And then in even lower power, I just had one strobe coming in from below. And that like lights up a little bit of that crinoid. Yeah? So this is uh, just a photo I really like that, that shows how top lighting can really work for you. Then you can light from the side. So here, obviously, dominant 
uh, uh, the animal is facing to the side. So it's important that light comes from the side. So that side lighting, here you've also got side lighting. And then you've got something that I like to call earmuffs. That is when the light comes from everywhere. And that is when we light from either side. So I call it earmuffs, you, whatever, the different names maybe. The advantage here is you're lighting the animal from both sides and the light goes actually through the animal, if it's a transparent animal or if it has lots of highlights. The other advantage is it's easier to create black backgrounds because you're just lighting this, you're not lighting what's behind it. So essentially that gives you that opportunity of making black backgrounds. And for example, in black water photography, it's quite a, a, a good technique. So for this photo, this is quite a useful way of lighting up just the animal and not any of the stuff behind it. So here, this is an example of a transparent animal that will benefit from lighting it from both sides. This is a very, very small uh, uh, fish. This is a baby uh, flying gurnard. And uh, this I also lit up from both sides so that you can see the fins and all the details of the fins light up nicely. So side lighting is good for uh, lighting up a whole animal and creating black backgrounds. And it's only really useful on small critters and when you're using diopters really. Now we come to another one of my uh, yeah, techniques I really like. Very difficult, but you, if you play with it, you can get uh, um, a quite an interesting result. I don't know if you guys can see where the light is coming from here. Any suggestions? Okay, well, um, if there are no suggestions that I, uh -huh, somebody, okay, Gotham is saying from the top, it's not correct. Aha. Okay, several people are saying from the front. Some people are saying from behind. The answer is both. Right. So essentially, if you look at the uh, if you look at the claws of the um, of the porcelain crab, you can see that clearly there's some light coming from the left. But there's also light coming from behind. It's actually shooting through and that allows for these fans that they use to filter is actually lighting up this area. So this is what I call inward lighting. And that is particularly useful for animals where you want the light to travel through. So if you've ever tried taking a picture of these sea hares, it's really horrible because they just don't separate from the background. So if you shoot from behind, you can get them to light up. This is a wide angle picture, but I really like to show the difference here. So on the left, you've got a picture of a moray eel that's just shot from the front. And here you've got a moray eel where I've got one strobe behind shooting backwards. And you can see that the teeth are much brighter lit up and the white mouth of the moray eel is much better visible because there's light traveling through. Um, and that is essentially uh, how you would set that up. You have one uh, strobe, from the front and one that's shooting backwards. And the best is actually if it's shooting past you backwards. Um, so it doesn't shoot directly into the camera. So here you can see the strobe is pointed sort of towards the outside of the camera and the fringe light will touch the back of the, in this case, nudibrank just ever so slightly to create nice little highlights. And that is how you can create these two directions. So you've got a main light that's lighting the subject from the front. And then you've got a highlight or back inward lighting strobe that will just do highlights for you. And that's, for example, how you can get the, uh, you know, these weird, um, I don't know what they call them, bristles or whatever that you have on a ghost pad fish. That's how you can light them up. You can do that by having, if you shoot it from the front, you'll find it quite hard to get them to really pop. Whereas if you shoot a little bit from behind, you can get them to become really, really bright. Or here, you can see the nose detail on, on this, um, on this uh, snake eel, not snake eel, what are they called? Ribbon eel. Um, you can see that shooting from behind, um, and you can see the behind light is from the left, you can see that the, we get the really nice pattern inside these nose details, as well as inside the eye. And that is a benefit from shooting backwards. So how would you do the process? Well, the process is to start with that backlighting. So you turn off your main strobe and just try to get the lighting right on the highlights that you want to achieve. So you just keep shooting it until you got that right and then you add the front lighting. 
So if you compare this and this, you can see that the highlights that I'm having here on the side are still the same. Yeah? Um, but the front lighting is much stronger, so that's why you want to start with the inward lighting first. So very, very useful uh, tool to make your uh, details come out, particularly transparent details work really, really well. Also to create a background structure, it's very useful. Um, if you do it, you need to power your strobe down way down because you're now shooting directly towards the camera, which means the light is much stronger. It's not from the strobe going to the subject rebounding into the camera, it's going directly into your camera. So you have to power it down. Also, you'll find that you start getting blind because you're actually shooting directly at yourself. So uh, you need to kind of find a way how you do that without um, you know, getting blurry spots in your vision. Now we'll come to snoot lighting. Um, which is a really, really useful tool for, um, uh, for uh, macro photography. Um, it is a way how you can bring something to life that's maybe otherwise not that exciting. So here you've got, you know, the Christmas tree worms that are, you know, just part of a coral. But if you shoot them with a snoot, you can make them pop real, real nice. And it's a much more interesting photo like this than it is just shooting them with normal lighting. Uh, obviously, that picture that I uh, had earlier with the octopus, you can see that you can make a blueing octopus that otherwise really flushes with the sandy bottom. So if you're like in Lembe or, or in Manado or in the Philippines somewhere where you're doing muck photography, these animals don't really come out. And so you're shining a light on top of them, making them really differentiate from the background. So you create subject separation, essentially, by using a snoot. Here's a good example of not an animal on a uh, on muck or something like that, but on a very colorful background. This zebra crab, that's a very exciting, really interesting looking animal, just doesn't pop out at all because uh, the the sea urchin that it lives on is is so colorful in itself. So with a, a snoot, you can make the animal just much, look much more interesting um, because you can now separate it from the background. You can also highlight details. Um, this is the, uh, you know, the antlers of a cone snail, uh, which are kind of the early stages of an eye. And if you shoot the whole animal, it's just really hard to get that in detail. So with a snoot, you can sort of isolate and just light up this individual item. Also, it's sometimes easier to get your light into certain areas with a snoot. You can direct, in this case, this is the flamboyant cuttlefish eggs, which are inside a coconut shell. So with a snoot, you can direct the light better into where you need it to go. You can also get really creative, and uh, Pauline will show us in a moment uh, how you can get an effect like this. But with a snoot, you can do all kinds of really, really interesting things, such as this is one of the things that you can do with a retro snoot, where they give you square holes, which Pauline will show in a moment. But you can create a very interesting photo like this, very sort of artsy uh, kind of thing. Uh, or here, that picture that I showed earlier with the clownfish uh, cleaning the eggs, you can make it in a very interesting highlight where you're just highlighting this particular part of the story, separating it from the background. You can also use a snoot to shoot bigger subjects. Alex Mustard does that quite a lot. Um, so um, using a snoot by moving it quite far away, you can create a nice spotlight for a bigger animal, like a frogfish or like this rhinopia. So this is a rhinopia is sitting in the coral. It looks exactly like the coral. So the, uh, the snoot it really helps you bring that animal to life, get this structure. And once you got that set up, if you're ready for it, you can take even other animals that you would never think about snooting. But when I was shooting this rhinopia in Puerto Galera, uh, I actually suddenly, my dive master was pointing out that there was a snake coming my way. So I actually took a photo of my snoot that was already set up for the rhinopia of the snake and I got my favorite snake photo that I have which is a macro photo of the uh, um, of the sea crate um, with really, really nice lighting on the face and then fading out light in the background so very very nice effect so even bigger animals you can shoot with a snoot you can also combine the effects together with torch lighting, but we'll come to torch lighting in a moment. But you don't only need to use one torch. You can use the torch together with another strobe or with, uh, sorry, you can use a snoot with a torch or another strobe. You can combine those effects, uh, really, you know, giving more, more variation to your uh, shots. 
Okay, Roman is asking how you can do a dark background with open aperture. Well, you can reduce the uh, brightness with your ISO, lowest ISO possible, and very fast shutter speed. So you can go to whatever your maximum shutter speed is before it gets darkened. So you can do that. And if you really, really want that, then you could also use an ND filter to further darken it. So you could screw on an ND filter on the inside of your housing, so inside of your camera, and that would reduce your uh, overall brightness. And then you could uh, basically uh, keep your aperture wider and while making the picture darker. So snoot lighting is really, really useful for uh, uh, creating black background pictures, obviously, because it also eliminates all the backscatter. So you're directing the lighting directly where you want it to be. Uh, and it helps also with surface lighting on bigger animals. There's all kinds of snoots, but um, actually I uh, um, gave my snoot recently to Pauline. And so that's why Pauline is today going to actually explain and show us different kinds of snoots. Also, Pauline is a much better macro photographer than I am. Um, and she does a lot more of it. So she has way more tools. And so she's going to point out a couple of snoots right now. So Pauline, can you, uh, can you join us? There she is. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Good. Thanks for coming. So Hi. I hope everybody can see you. Um, I am, I hope everybody can see everybody, uh, see Pauline. I hope so. <laughs> yes, he can hear me. That's good. God and said good. he can. Okay, good. All yours. All right. So the first one I'm going to show you is the Retro LSE. So that's what you get when you come um, take it out of the package. And it also got um, four aperture cuts that come with it. So essentially what it does is actually it's got a lens inside that when you attach it to your strobe, it will focus all the light beams of your strobe into a really narrow, powerful um, beam for your subject so to attach it first with the stroke with the retro um, with the enon stroke you have to take off the diffuser and then you have the position you can see that with that's where the light's coming in um, to match the focus light so when you set up it's very nice and easy you can just um, attach it onto your bcd when you go underwater and then just clip it in and then that's how it looks like. And when you use it, you always have to turn the focus light on. Okay. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, with the retro, one thing to remember is that there's a focusing distance. It's about 2.5 centimeters, uh, 2.5 inches to what's your subject. So I can see if you get too close to the subject, um, the light actually couldn't focus. So you have to move to about 2.5 inches away from the subject and you get a really nice um, circle of beams that uh, got really clean edge. That's when the beam is um, got the best light quality. So because with the snoot, um, it's essentially just a directional light. So you can also play with doing like side lightings and um, doing spot lighting on your subject. And if you want to have um, smaller beam size, you use these aperture cards. So you just insert it through here. So now you can see the size of the beam has heavily reduced. So like say for a nudie rank, you can, don't know if you can see that, you can highlight the details with the smaller circles, or if you want to do the creative um, ones like what Simon did, you've got this square aperture cuts. So it will look like that. Uh, does it show? Hang on. Yeah. yeah, that's a better one. Okay. And the next one, uh, turn it off. So before you explain the next one, so if you just hold yeah. it on, on time. So sure. um, when we all started and, you know, 
was for me the same and I think for Pauline as well. In the beginning, you're kind of shocked how expensive this thing is because it's almost as expensive as the strobe. So then you start playing with the cheaper versions, but essentially this is the number one snoot because it is so good. And one thing that's very important is what you see here is that light that is the focus light that is already sh uh, sh showing you where the whole strobe light is gonna land is actually pretty accurate. In all the old snoots that I had, it just either wouldn't show it at all or it would be completely off. So if you were planning to, uh, to, to light up, you know, uh, some animal, you had to like, you had to like target next to it. And then, you know, and here with this one, you actually light up exactly what it shows you what it's going to light up. And so that's making it extremely useful. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So for those who think it's too big, we've also got, <laughs> we've got another one. <laughs> now with the latest toy is the Backscatter Mini Flash. So this one actually comes with um, it's two bits. So this one is a strobe um, with two LED lights. So it's really handy for like point and shoot camera. Um, if you don't want to invest in the proper strobe yet. Um, and you mostly do macro stuff, so this is a good alternative. You only use one single um, battery, it's 18650, uh, but with the button top, so it's a slightly different one from your normal um, torch battery. And then it gives you um, six different um, intensity settings. So to turn it on, you press um, five times in two seconds. So now you can see it's on, and then you can change. So, and also give you a focus light. So you press one, turn it on, be good. Three intensity, two, three, very bright. Very strong. Yeah, they're really strong. So it's good enough for close focus wide angle, but if you want to do a proper wide angle photo, this is not um, strong enough. So the beautiful thing is this one, you can also purchase the snoot bit, which is separate. And this one's also got the lens. So, um, and then you just attach it on top um, of your uh, stroke bit. It also give you two sets of aperture cards. So three, um, circ one circular ones and one is uh, eclipse one. So now when you have, same with the Retra, it also have a working distance, but when you turn on, it's really strong, yeah. it's really bright. So, um, and because I normally start off with like, to the index number, like three, half power. Um, this is the focus light, so you can like, depends on your diving um, condition, you can turn it up and down. And if you have like, some subjects really skittish and you can't shine the focus light on. If you do long press, it would do like a flashing light for a few seconds. So at least you know where you are snooting. So with, um, so this one has um, 500 lumens of LED dual beam and one battery lasts about a, an hour dive. And then this one you can slot in here to control yeah, it's different. The same actually. Yes. The solution is the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the set the smallest um, cutout is six millimeters for that one. So you can do like really just you know do your highlight, or if you have a new smaller like super macro subjects. So when you do it and underwater, you can also find like if you have a slate or find your sandy bottom and make sure the light beam, the edges is really clean. So that's when you have the best light quality. So if you only have like one of these as your snoot or as a strobe, I would normally put it like on top of your housing doing like angle like that. Um, yeah. Good. And then it also come with, oh, hang on, with the stroke bit, it also has a diffuser that you can just attach. So and it has... Do you know what the guide number is? 
when you're using it as a flash? Uh, so I think, um, I'm not sure, I have to check the specification yeah. again, but it comes with the board adapter and the YS. Yeah, yeah. So it's good, you know. Well, you've been using it quite a bit, so you, you do like it as an alternative to the whole shebang, right? Yeah, especially like in Hong Kong, because it's a lot, a very heavy to carry stroke with the um, retra as well. So for this, it's easier and lighter. If I need to use um, just the stroke without the snoop bead, I also add that this little um, cord and I just clip it. So it's very easy. Well, please bring it next week when we go diving on Wednesday, because I really yes. want to. You can try. Can try. So, uh, anybody who's in Hong Kong, join us next week. We're doing a photography day. Um, and Pauline and I will both be, be there. So uh, join us then. Okay, uh, we're going to get you back in a moment for the torches. But um, if you just turn off your uh, video and audio sure. just for a moment. Thank you for that. Um, so let me just go back to um, the snoot. I just want to answer some questions um, that came up. Hang right, on a second. Um, so uh, Teresa said she doesn't want to get into snoots. You can see now that there's a small one available if you want to get into it. Um, they are indeed really going to give you a lot more play with your uh, photography. And Kaylee, uh, Barton's homemade Asahi snoot is, is really hard to use. So um, it, there's a lot of work. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I had these kind of ones that you see here on the right, which just direct the light. I've also tried to make one myself. But really, you want the one with the lens in the front because that's the one where you can actually get a really nice, crisp um, um, prediction of where your light's going to land. So uh, Salvatore asked about um, uh, where to position just before we get there. There's two ways on how you can actually direct the lighting. Uh, Pauline was already showing this. So you can obviously do the spot lighting, which is what you see on the right. It's just lighting from the top. But also, you can use it angled to actually isolate the subject. So you can see on the, uh, on the le left picture that the animal is just on the outer ring of the spotlight and therefore is nicely um, separated from the background. So spotlight is not always the right solution. Um, you have both of those choices. Um, so generally, um, this is how you would set it up. So if you had a second strobe uh, as well, um, then you would uh, put it on one. And I would always suggest it to put it on the left side because the right side is where you have your trigger finger and all your controls. You wanna have the, your left hand where you actually adjust the stroke, yeah? So you wanna put it on the left arm, and if you have only a single stroke, I would also mount that arm on the left side, because that is how you uh, then can move it around. And um, uh, there's two ways. One is the fixed arm setting. That's basically uh, when you basically take your finger and you get yourself set up and you fix the arm, you clamp it really sharp, shut, and then you basically have the same distance always. So if your snoot is like this and you move the camera, it basically moves with, right? That is really useful when you've got an animal that's moving. So when the animal is moving you, and you're adjusting this and you're trying to not touch the bottom, it's getting quite messy. So uh, for example, a mimic octopus, you know, that keeps on moving. It's best if you've got a fixed setup and then you can just follow him with the camera. And here's the advantage over these self-made ones. If it has a spotlight, you can already see always if you're in the right area. If you don't have the spotlight, then you don't know where it's going. And I remember I even ordered once this snoot that had like a laser pointer that would point the laser at where it goes. But that still doesn't show you how wide the light beam is gonna be. That is why the backscatter snoot and the retro snoot are the best ones because they kind of give you an indication pretty much exactly where your light's gonna land once you press the trigger. So if you have a moving subject, you, you wanna go for the fixed arm approach. But if like a, a walking frogfish, for example, um, they don't, not that fast, so you could do a flexible arm, but generally it's easier if you have a fixed arm. The flexible arm is when you actually keep adjusting it. And for that, you need to be very stable. You need to be not in touching the bottom that much. Um, you need to be at a good distance and you want to have it clamped, but not too loose. If you make it super loose, then it's constantly you know, moving around. If you do it fully flex, that means somebody else should hold the, the snoot. 
That's another way how you can do the flexible arm is where you basically unclamp the whole thing and you give the strobe with the snoot to your dive buddy or your dive master and they will actually point the snoot for you. But if you're doing it by yourself, you want to clamp it so that it's movable, but when you let go, it will actually stay in that position. Yeah? And that is better for stationary animals. And if you want to try varying effects, you want to take a photo with this angle and that angle and this angle and this angle, that is the best uh, if you have a slightly flexible setup. For example, uh, the sap sucking uh, uh, slugs or uh, shawl the sheep nudies, they just don't move very far. So here it might be useful to actually be able to slightly adjust the snoot position. One important tip, so I know there's some of you that don't have a snoot yet and don't want to get a snoot, but once you get a snoot, you will see that there's a huge risk of over snooting, where suddenly your entire trip to Lembe is only black background, which then starts getting boring. So generally, you need to uh, just remind it to future self, once you get a snoot, that remember that there's actually lots of other photos that you can take as well, and that you don't over snoot. Another snoot technique that I find super interesting is what I call uh, either double inward or x-ray. That's basically when you direct the snoot in a way that it really lights up the entire animal. Um, so that's essentially this kind of position. Um, the other strobe is off and you're shooting the snoot from the back directly through the animal. So this is one of these techniques where it's best if actually somebody does that for you. You can do it yourself, but it's really difficult. Um, uh, but if you unclamp your arms, you can even take off the front uh, of the strobe and give the strobe. In my case, what I usually do is I make the clamps really, really loose so that it's still attached, but the dive master can then actually move the strobe around. And if you're moving, he can still keep focused on the same subject. So if you go for a different angle, the, his snoot is still in the right position. So that's a way to do this. But you can do this yourself. So here, this is a zebra crab I did this year, um, which I did myself shooting from behind. I also did this one by myself, uh, a ribbon eel in Lembe, where I had this uh, snoot really far away. So it looks really weird because your arm is really stretched out like that and then shooting back. But I got a really nice detail shot uh, like that that I'm really happy with. Here's another x-ray style of, of a little cuttlefish. You can see it's really lighting up the entire animal. You can see the eye and you can also see, you know, the plate that they still have in the back, which is the only uh, bone that they have left. Uh, in their body um, and that just comes out as a really, really nice x-ray shot. Also this photo uh, um, is a big, bigger uh, flamboyant cuttlefish, so not enough to actually x-ray it so that it actually shines through, but in a way that really makes the highlights come out really, really nice. Did quite some work on Photoshop afterwards, but essentially got a photo which was on my shot list. I uh, uh, really wanted to have that. You can also take photos like that without the snoot. So double inward, that's what I call double inward. It's basically two strobes firing backwards. You can also get an x-ray photo. You can also do it with bigger animals, put the strobes further out like this. And then you can do something like this. So here, this is shot with two strobes further out. And what I wanted to try and get is the focus on the parasite. And you can see the, the, these weird breathing things that the parasites have are fully lit up because the light is coming in from behind. Yeah, or skeleton shrimp, also lit from behind. That's how you actually make it separate from the background. And here finally is a seahorse. That's again with a snoot. Um, and you can get a really, really nice result when you angle it just right. You can see the brain and the whole guts and stuff. So really nice little effect to play with if you've got one of them. If you're using it just to use highlights, so this is uh, uh, one of the really hard uh, seahorses to shoot in the first place, Pontohi. Um, and this animal is literally like uh, less than a centimeter or just a centimeter maybe. So if you want to get that, it's already difficult enough. But then I try to get the highlights on these weird hairs that they have. Um, and so that's where the dive master is really holding the snoot, guiding the snoot in order to light up um, these highlights. So help each other out. Um, even if you're just diving, two of you, I very often just park my camera and help somebody else taking those photos. So quite a useful thing. Um, to do. Uh, so keep that in mind that it's often a teamwork exercise. So last topic for today is torch lighting. So you can use your torch uh, in, uh, uh, to your advantage because when you're not using a strobe, obviously your light is, is what you get. So whatever way you light it, so here you've got two uh, torches lighting these two uh, uh, nudibranchs 
and whatever you see is what you're going to get. As long as your camera is able to take photos at that kind of light, then you can create quite nice photos by just using torches and don't use any strobe at all. So this photo I took actually with two different torches, one torch to light up the bottle and one torch to light up the animal. So that is how I got this photo to make the bottle look green, uh, but the animal to still pop out. You can also use that to do background highlighting. If you did this with a snoot, you would light through the animal. But because I'm using a torch that I placed just behind the seahorse, I can get this really, really nice outline. That is a very nice effect. Here I did it with a, a pipe worm. So you can do it in two different ways. You can either position the torch sort of at an angle, yeah, so that you're shining through, or you position it behind, but then the animal needs to be big enough so that the torch doesn't shine directly into your picture. Um, so there's also a lot of uh, torches that you can have, and Pauline has way more torches than me. So Pauline, if you would come back and show us some of your amazing torch collection. <laughs> so I've got video light, another video light that's got colored. I've got like narrow beams, normal torch dive torch, and I've got the softer ones that got other colors. But my favorite ones has to be the mini gear MS-03 for all the snooting. So I've actually owned four of them. Um, four. four? Yes. You have to play with colors. So let me go through what it does. So when you order that in, you can order it like a standard with the snoot tip. So the standard is um, only 350 lutements, but it's quite strong enough just for your normal snooting. Uh, where's my card? So on land, you can see it's actually square, but because the optics, um, they're designed for underwater, so when you go underwater, it will become circular. So the best thing is, well, the only thing is because it's like a funnel style snoot, so the light quality will be reduced a bit. So I actually ordered the full set that comes with the four, the rotator wheels, got three different optics that focus the beam. So it turns the normal 350 lumens into 41,000 lumen, basically. So you attach it to the top bit here. And it also comes with all these wonderful color filters that I love. So you can see, so I think the different size are from like 25 millimeters to like go down to eight millimeters. So different quality of light, different intensity. And the other thing is, if you press this button here, it actually reduces the light intensity. So because it's a torch, you can't be, um, you don't have as many, much options with this, uh, as a stroke in terms of um, power, but it does have a, quite a variety. So with the color filters, they give you the da uh, adapters to go on top. So I usually just put, all this in. So when I shoot my macro and I like to do like lots of um, creative stuff with color lights, um, so I usually do like with my, give you the red light and then you can like, with a nudie bank, you can do like a red on the back and then maybe use another one as a normal uh, suit light just to highlight the rainforest. So it's lots of um, variety and then you can use it to highlight the background and then use another one to highlight the subjects. So this one is really versatile if you don't want to buy a snoot. <laughs> so this is essentially a torch and you don't have to have lots of battery, just your normal torch battery. Easy to just hang on your busy or if you have um, pockets in your busy or 
um, tech pans with pockets you can just put it in and when you're working with it you can always just you know you don't like the light and then you just swap it and change it around and um, of course uh, you can use this and work with your normal torch so and they are really really just um, lightweight if you you know worry about the weight going traveling and it gives you lots of options and I've seen like people go and cut up different colors uh, of acrylics as well so you can have your own personal color if you want well so if you think she's not taking all of these underwater you're mistaken she will go hanging like a christmas tree with all of these torches <laughs> and then she'll start building up underwater so um you bring a couple next week are we going to do macro next week yeah i think so yeah depends on where you're going yeah well, normally if i do mackerels i would like bring all my torches just get ready because you never know and then you can place all your torches and stage and depends on um the surroundings sometimes you've got really nice like whip corals that you can highlight you know you can i think we're gonna do macro although the water is really clear right now i think we'll do macro <laughs> okay. all right well thanks right. for that um, thanks for having me so i'm yeah. gonna go yeah just uh turn your video up hi <laughs> Um, so just uh, uh, last slides. Hang on, I have to share my screen again. Oops. Right. Uh, so if you have all these different torches, you can also combine them with the strobe. So here you've got a torch that I just put on a on a night dive on the sand and waited for the fish to swim right in front. So then you. Um, one moment. Back. Um, so then you can combine both strobe light and um, uh, both strobe light and uh, torch light together to create an effect together. Like here, for example, this is something we're playing with on our last photo workshop last year. Everybody was working on these. Is basically using the torch to light up the bottle, which is a green color bottle, and have the yellow goby pop up for that. So here you're using uh, a normal strobe light from the front. Uh, but a torch from the back that then gets the, the, the bottle to uh, color up nice and green. Um, here um, I'm using a torch to light up the details from the frogfish and light up the, the rest of the frogfish with the normal strobe. So you can really combine the two to do nice effects like here as well. You can see the fin between the back is lit up. That is because I'm using a torch there behind. And this is another one where you have a yellow light in the back. So these are the, the possibilities um, that you have. Um, so Pauline is obviously much, much more into macro than I am. So um, I'm going to share in the email that I'll send out tomorrow when the recording is ready. I'll send out her, um, her website and her links so you can uh, get a bit of an idea. She really uses a lot of the colors. Really, really interesting um, to look at. And uh, yeah, I can just uh, encourage you to do something like that as well, where you just combine the different techniques in lighting. Um, and just let your creativity run. It's really important in macro that you just get creative uh, because just pictures of nudibranchs are boring. So try to be creative when you do your uh, uh, um, macro photography, make use of the different tools, um, and then you will have a lot more fun with the, um, uh, with the photography. So uh, next week, I'm gonna do more creative techniques or next week in two weeks, like super wide aperture, creative uh, bokeh, disco bokeh, uh, long exposure, super macro. So we'll be doing all these things. Good that we didn't do them today because we're already overrun with time. So I would like to know if there are any questions uh, on today's session. Just put your questions into um, the chat or the Q&A. Uh, Pauline's torch is the, uh, Pauline, could you put that in the chat? Um, I can also send it later. It's the scuba gear, I don't know what it's called. Um, it's a yeah, very powerful tool. You can order it from Backscatter, I think as well. You can definitely order it in most places, yeah. Any other questions?
Devo, we're going to cover that next time. Um, I just took that out of it today. Um, so slow exposure, we're going to be covering next uh, next time. Yeah? So uh, just uh, join us next time for, for slow exposure. Um, yeah, uh, I'll put it all in the email. Um, um, all the things that Pauline is using, I'm going to send you all the names in the email. Any other questions? Okay, guys, before we stop, I just want to point out this week, we've got a really good photographer uh, joining us. Um, Alfred Minar uh, is a South African photographer, lives in Bali, is really famous for um, his captivating photography, particularly of people. So um, really, really interesting um, for anybody because you'll see that it's more the way he takes his photos. He actually very often doesn't use strobe light. So uh, make sure you join for that one. That's on Thursday, same time. Uh, and next week, uh, really, really great, uh, Richard Barton is gonna join us. He's one of the founders of Unique Diving Expeditions in Palau. And uh, I've done uh, three uh, spawning, uh, well, three spawns, but on several trips. So every time I go to Palau, I try to do one of these spawns with them. And he's like the best at taking pictures of these spawns. They have already proven 24 different species that spawn in Palau, and he's got photos of all of them. He's also gonna talk about how he captures those, uh, what his techniques are. He recently, uh, well, last year, became underwater photographer of the year with a spawning shot from French Polynesia. He's now branched out from Palau. So make sure you join for that one. That's a really powerful talk. That's next week, Thursday. If you want to support us with a little tip, I actually noticed just before this, this link's not working. I'm going to send you the link in the email. So if you want to drop a tip in the tip jar um, uh, to, for me to uh, finance the webinar software that I have to pay every month, that would be really appreciated. Um, and uh, also, please uh, uh, go at the YouTube uh, channel and follow the YouTube channel. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers. Then I get a little bit more tools that I can use. So um, please subscribe. Also helps you to get updated when there's new videos out. There's almost one or two every week. So uh, make sure you subscribe to that. And then, oops, that went a bit quick. And then join us in two weeks uh, for the next session uh, on macro photography. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for um, joining. Thank you for being there. And yeah, spread the word. Uh, some more people join us next time. And for those who are in Hong Kong, join us next week, Wednesday, when we go diving in Hong Kong on our photography workshop. So have a good one, everybody. Good to see you all and have a nice evening.